Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Pearl Global Industries Limited Q3 and 9 months FY24 earnings conference call. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements about the company, which are based on the beliefs, opinions, and expectations of the company as on date of this call. These statements are not the guarantees of future performance and involve risks and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchdown phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Pallab Banerjee, Managing Director of Pearl Global Industries Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to our Q3 and uh, nine months of financial year 24 earnings conference call. Along with me, we have the group CFO, Mr. Sanjay Gandhi, and SGA, our investor relations advisors. I hope all of you have gone through the investor presentation uploaded on the exchange and our company website. We are happy to report highest ever nine months performance since the inception. Demonstrating a promising growth, this growth is primarily driven by 20% increase in our overseas revenue, particularly from the sales in Bangladesh and Vietnam. However, the revenue from India was negatively affected. This was due to an overall less order and we could relocate some of our production to competitive locations like Bangladesh while maintaining our market share with our customers in a conservative environment. Now, with the holiday sales in the U.S. being over, all retailers and brands have successfully recovered from the over-inventory situation of last year. Looking ahead, we anticipate a gradual improvement in the consumer sentiment, showcasing a resilience and strength of the U.S. and other economies. There are some concerns in the U.S. with uncertainties of election this year and the ongoing wars. However, on the positive side, we are looking forward to interest cuts by Fed and also across other developed economies. With the expected decrease in the inflationary pressure, we anticipate an overall improvement in textile and manufacturing uh, trade. Despite the challenges, our multinational presence in manufacturing and sales, diversified product offerings, robust design, and strong customer relationships have solidified our positions globally, making us the preferred vendor for increasing number of customers. While amongst all of our export business uh, to the reputed Western customers, uh, this is uh, regarding the, uh, the Red Sea situation, I must say that uh, while all the export business of the reputed Western customers is done on freight on board terms, increase of freight costs does not affect us. All our customers have long-term rates negotiated with the carriers, so it is not even affecting them. However, this increases the transit time for goods going to Europe and U.S. from India and Bangladesh by one week. Some U.S. retailers are cautious of their inventory and their books and asking the factories to prepone their shipments by one week. Our manufacturing setup in Guatemala, where, trans where transit time is just over a week, is getting more queries and lots of interest from these customers. However, capacity in Central America is limited and would be just a fraction of that of Asia. So in terms of Vietnam and Indonesia, what we are seeing is, is the vessels, they trans uh, transit through the Pacific Ocean for the west coast of US, so there is no effect at all. Uh, Pearl's diversion, uh, diverse location is a huge strength to tackle such a global logistics challenges that comes up uh, time to time. In terms of global textiles and apparel exports, China's share has been on the decline and due to various geopolitical factors and rising manufacturing costs, business from Myanmar well, also sir. shifted to the geopolitics. I'm sorry to interrupt, well, can you hear me? There's a disturbance from your end, Pallav, sir. Yeah, can you hear me? 
This is a crackling sound. Is it still persisting? Yes, it's fine. You can go ahead. Okay, so uh, should I repeat my last uh, paragraph? Yes, yes. What I was talking about, yeah. Okay, so I will uh, speak once again uh, from from the logistics point of view. Uh, this is uh, regarding the some disturbance that happened in the Red Sea for shipping. So in that regards, while most of uh, our export business to all the reputed Western customers is done on freight on board or FOB terms, that is why the increase of freight cost does not affect the business. And for the customers who are uh, paying for this freight, for they also have long-term rates negotiated with the carriers. So it is not even affecting them either. Uh, however, this increases the transit time for goods going to Europe and US from India and Bangladesh by one week. And some of the US retailers and European retailers are cautious of their inventory and they are uh, what they are asking the factories is to prepone by one week. That's the utmost the effect that we are seeing because of this uh, Red Sea situation. Our manufacturing setup in Guatemala, uh, from where to US the transit time is just over a week, is getting more queries and lots of interest from these customers. Uh, however, as you know, the capacity all across Central America is uh, limited and would just be a fraction of that of the Asia as on date. Vietnam and Indonesia, uh, is not affected as their vessels travel through the Pacific Ocean for the west coast of U.S. And Pearl, uh, as a company, is location is a huge strength uh, tackling kind of global logistics challenge that comes up time and again. In terms of global textile exports, okay. Uh, hello, everyone, once again. Uh, apologies for the technical inconvenience that we had. Uh, as I was speaking, like in terms of global textiles and apparel exports, China's share has been on decline due to various geopolitical factors and also the rising manufacturing costs. Apart from that, business from Myanmar shifted out due to the geopolitics again. For us, our presence in Bangladesh and Vietnam has become more advantageous. So is Indonesia. These countries have seen a boost in their global apparel trade share. Bangladesh, in particular, has become a leader in the garment factories. Thanks to substantial investments in green growth, meeting the demands of the consumers of the West, this shift has greatly benefited us, allowing us for more effective factory utilization and improved efficiencies. Uh, in regards to the Bangladesh wage revision, as we had discussed in our last quarter's call, that increase in Bangladesh wages would create an impact uh, between 12 to 15 percent in our wage bills, and overall, if I look at Bangladesh's PNL perspective, it changes by approximately 1 to 1.5 percent on the uh, compared to the top line. If we continue to operate as is, however, if we we have strategies in place to mitigate this increase, which entails more automation, bringing in more efficiency with increase in business and by adding better profile of customers. Hello? Hello, Pallav. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Please go. Am ahead. I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. So as I'm mentioning, like we have a solid connection with our top five, six customers for over a decade now. These partnerships have really thrived over the years while we have expanded and welcomed new customers on board. With offices, staff, and design teams in USA, UK, and Spain, we are able to serve our customers even more effectively and keep our supply chain running smoothly. Our asset light model approach continues to help us to enhance their performance metrics. Looking ahead, we are focused on further boosting our metrics in a similar way. Our primary objective is to elevate our success to even greater heights by surpassing 
our previous revenue growth records, which will directly impact our bottom line. We are committed to achieving this goal through multifaceted approach. The in this includes the introduction of new product categories, fortifying our existing customer relationships, and expanding their share of wallet. Moreover, our objective extends to drawing the fresh clientele while nurturing a dynamic, adaptable, and inventive workforce committed to bringing Pearl Global's vision to success. We are pleased to announce we are strengthening the Pearl Global leadership team at the board level with introduction of Dr. Rajiv Kumar, Mr. Sanjay Kapoor, and Mr. Ashwini Agarwal. The profiles and a portion of the deck has been uploaded into the exchange. Their arrival promises to introduce unmatched experience driving both innovation and success. With their vast expertise, they are set to strengthen the company's strategic objectives, guaranteeing ongoing success in this sector. Their forward-thinking leadership harmonizes effortlessly with our dedication to innovation, bolstering our preparedness for the continual growth within our ecosystem. Furthermore, we wish to inform that Pearl Global will be hosting an investor analyst meet on 26th of February in Mumbai at Geo Convention Center to discuss various growth opportunities and way forward of the company over the next three to five years. The formal invitation consisting of all details will be uploaded on the stock exchange soon and we would be happy to meet everyone and discuss our strategy for the future growth. Now, I would like to hand over the call to Mr. Sanjay Gandhi, our group CFO, who will provide you with the insights of financial performance. Sanjay, over to you. Thank you, Pallav. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Q3 and 9-month FI24 Early Conference Call. Coming to the financial and operational performance of the company, we have reported the highest ever 9-month performance. On a consolidated basis, 9-month FI24 revenue increased by 5.4% year-on-year to INR 2,558.8 crore on account of improved capacity utilization from Bangladesh and Vietnam factories and our multi -persons. Our India revenue <coughs> saw an adverse impact due to shifting of sale from turnover to competitive location like Bangladesh. On a consolidated basis, adjusted EBITDA, excluding the ease of expenses, stood at INR 232.5 crore for nine months FI24 as compared to INR 192.7 crore for nine months FI23, a growth of 21% year on year while margin improved by 125 year-on-year from 7.9% in nine months FI23 to 9.1% in nine months FI24. Ease of expenses for nine months FI24 stood at INR 6.1 crore. Nine months FI23 had no ease of expenses. The factor contributing to the margin enhancement were the enhanced operational efficiency and increased profitability due to improving efficiency in Bangladesh and Vietnam units. Finance costs increased from INR 48.9 crore in nine months FI23 to INR 60.9 crore in nine months FI24 on account of increase in uh, factoring costs for receivable financing, increase in interest costs on short term and long term borrowing, and interest for lease amortization. Our return on capital employed improved from 21.9% in nine months FI23 to 26.3% in nine months FI24 due to improved asset turn and improvement in profitability. This is calculated on a 12-month training basis. <coughs> Reported PBT for 9-month FI24 was INR 137.7 crore and was INR 199.9 crore for 9 months FI23, a growth of 15% on year on this basis. PAT stood at INR 120.1 crore, a growth of 20.5% year on year basis. Revenue for the quarter stood at INR 704 crore, adjusted a bit of a quarter PFI 24 stood at INR 68.6 crore compared to INR 73.2 crore in quarter PFI 23. Quarter PFI 24 margin stood at 9.7% versus 10.2% in quarter 3 FI 23. 
Uh, effective text rate uh, was lower on a group basis due to high concentration of profit in overseas entity. Back for quarter three, FI24 stood at INR 33.8 crore compared to INR 37.4 crore in quarter three, FI23. Coming to standalone performance, revenue for nine months, FI24 saw, 24 saw a dip of 24% year on year to INR 33.6 crore. Our adjusted EBITDA saw a dip of 40% year on year for nine months, FI24 from INR 48.2 crore to INR 28.7 crore in nine months, FI24. Pat for nine months, FI24 stood at INR 16.3 crore, a drop of 37% year on year basis. Quarter 3, FI24 revenue stood at INR 157.6 crore, adjusted EBITDA stood at minus 0.8 crore, PAT grew by 52% to INR 3.5 crore. This was because the tax rate had increased due to non-taxable pass-through dividend income. Uh, sorry, because the tax rate had decreased due to non-taxable pass-through dividend income. The standalone business saw an impact due to shifting of order to BD and slack in demand. However, we believe the worst quarter is behind us and going ahead we are confident on the industry growth and we believe that our company is best placed to capture the largest pie of this opportunity. Uh, regarding Bangladesh wage increase impact on earnings, um, uh, which we have already men mentioned by Pallav that it is approximately 1 to 1.5 percent of Bangladesh top line in their PNL. However, from the risk, risk mitigation perspective, there are many measures which have been taken. As such, we don't see any adverse impact on earnings in coming quarter. Furthermore, KPMG has been designated as our statutory auditor in Bangladesh as a strategic step towards fostering good corporate governance practices in overseas operations. At this moment, um, overseas operations contribute more than 80% of our profit. This commitment reinforces our dedication to fortify our corporate governance framework. Thank you. We shall now open the floor for questions and answers. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone? who wishes to ask a question, may press star and 1 on the test on telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have our first question from the line of Prerna Junjunwala from Idara Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, detailed uh, presentation uh, and outlook. I would still want to understand uh, how is your order book stacking up given that you are saying that you are, uh, we should expect gradual improvement in demand scenario. So, could you just help us understand what kind of growth should we expect or uh, how muted uh, the scenario is for the next two to three quarters? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, when, I, when I spoke about uh, the conservative approach in terms of uh, the demand, that's because of the macro factors that is prevailing all over the world, whether the elections across so many democracies of the world and also especially USA and uh, in the war situation that we are seeing. Uh, in terms of order book, uh, yes, we have, uh, you know, exercising all our strategies that we are in place. So on the long short term, like for the next two quarters, we are not seeing any, uh, uh, you know, dearth of orders at this point of time to fill up our order book. So, but yes, in the long term, like these are the uh, risks that the market still has. Uh, I would say, like as we are seeing, the U.S. Uh, uh, the Trump's uh, presidency uh, option is coming more and more clear. So there are certain companies which are going to go conservative at this point of time. So those those ups and downs will continue to uh, be there in the market, and that's why we said, like you know, on the other hand, if the interest rates uh, starts going down, that should definitely help the market. Uh, to go up uh, in terms of their consumer behavior. Okay, understood. So, sir, uh, what kind of capacity utilization should we be operating in for the next 
two quarters. I'm still not very clear on the near term scenario that I mean. Yeah. Your voice. So, you see, like uh, what we uh, what we had in the last uh, uh, three quarters, two to three quarters, where most of of the uh, manufacturers had uh, to take uh, a slow approach because the demand in USA has especially gone down because most of the retailers had a lot of over inventory, uh, and they bought in the up up the year, but were selling till holiday season of this year. So your voice is that not clear. That problem is. I'm so sorry. Mr. Pallav, is it is it better now? No, sir. Hello. Hello, is it better? It is much better than earlier. Can you hear me? In between, it goes, uh, it cracks in between. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, what I'm saying is, uh, the the problem that we had over the last three quarters, where uh, not only us, I think you must have heard from others as well, like the auto book scenario was. Not so good because they had a lot of inventory, especially in the U.S. market. So order books that was coming from the U.S. market was slow and muted because they had most of the retailers had inventory from the earlier year. So that particular problem is now behind us. Uh, in their in their holiday season, which ended in December, most of these inventory or over inventory position that they had has been cleared. So now it is uh, that how robust did they come? Uh, they see the market or the consumer. Demand would be. So when I speak of a conservative approach in terms of consumer demand, that's a being more of a normal term compared to uh, last year's situation that we are facing. So yes, compared to last year, the order books are much better. Our capacities are filled. Our order book is full at this point of time for the next couple of quarters. So we don't see any problem in order books in the short term. But yes, whether the market would go a gung ho and or full force at this point of time, there I feel. This, when I speak to our customers in all the, uh, especially in the U.S. and all, we, we see that there is still the conservative approach for them. Uh, but remember one thing: like when they had an inventory situation, they were buying almost 30 to 40 percent less compared to any conservative approach that they would be doing. They might be buying only five, seven percent less. So, as a market, we do have a play of more than 25 percent from year on year uh, in terms of U.S. market, especially. Other markets continue to be normal, and we are not seeing a big change, uh, either negative or positive, at this point of time. This is very helpful. Because, yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you. And uh, the second, uh, how are the margins uh, now? Given that uh, demand is picking up, so are we in, uh, in a better position to command some pricing and uh, improve our margins further, or uh, is pricing pressure prevails? In current scenario, so the pricing pressure that happens because of raw material prices and the capacity, like open capacities or unfilled capacities across the globe, so that situation is definitely getting better, which was there uh, earlier. So that is definitely getting better, but it is not to that extent as of now that you can see a huge rise in the uh, in the raw material prices or any other things. So. So as of now, I would say it's much better than last year. But if you talk of 2021-22, when when like really like the raw material prices went through the roof because suddenly there was a huge demand, that situation is not foreseen as of now. Understood, sir. Thank you for the detailed answers. I'll come back to the question to you for any further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before we take the next question. A reminder to all the participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Dhruv Shah from Amika Finca. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my first question, Palab, is on your current quarter. So, uh, will you attribute the degrowth mainly due to Bangladesh problems uh, the industry is facing in Bangladesh? Uh, no, as we mentioned, that you know uh, what would happen uh, in this particular quarter, uh, we had a face situation in which our order books were less, and because the U.S. market was not placing their business, like uh, I'm sure, like you have heard it in early calls as well, like when the U.S. had an over inventory situation, they were placing almost 25, 30, 40 percent when certain customers were placing less compared to what they normally buy. Uh, so that resulted in 
the preference of the country that goes in is Vietnam and Bangladesh for us because their capacity and the cost competitiveness that we could get there is much better than what we had in India. So as a result, some of the orders that we prefer to service from Bangladesh compared to India uh, on that last quarter. So our dip, if you can see, is more in India compared to the other places like Bangladesh and Vietnam, which where our order books actually went up. That's a strategic decision that we took uh, to make sure that we hold on to the wallet share of our customers. So, uh, can we Does that answer that your question? Current quarter, are we seeing business as usual in Bangladesh? Yeah, yeah. Bangladesh, we don't see any uh, disruption. So, before the election, there were some kind of disturbance, I think, which you must have read in the media. But, for example, uh, our factories, we have uh, four uh, big, large factories out there and some other partner factories. So, only one of the factories was affected for about uh, two and a half or three days. Apart from that, we never had any kind of problem. So, as a result, Bangladesh, uh, the before election, there were a lot of, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, stoppages and all that we could see in the media was to make sure that they, uh, the, the opposition or maybe the workforce was trying to make sure that the wage increase happens in time. So, once that had happened, after that, uh, work has been quite normal. We haven't seen any kind of uh, disruptions. Right now, we have 44% of our capacity in Bangladesh. So, in three years down the line, what kind of percentage will Bangladesh contribute to your top line? I just wanted to have a rough figure of Bangladesh in your overall scheme of things. So, we our strategy is to have uh, in any location. We are not going like you know over uh, board. So, we should continue to see about anywhere between 30 to 40% from Bangladesh. So let's say 30, 35% is is our goal. But in that range, we'll continue. So you'll see similar kind of growth would be happening in India and Vietnam and other places also. But yes, there are a lot of opportunities at this point of time in Bangladesh because uh, they had recently had a wage increase. So naturally, the factories which were inefficient or which are not poorly, uh, not well managed, with, there are some people like who will be slowing down or getting out of business. So there is definitely a lot of shake will happen in Bangladesh, which is happening. We can as we speak. And that uh, is an advantage that we will be having. Right, right. Uh, and on the um, on the growth per se, uh, can we expect you guys to clock in 15 to 20 percent what you have been guiding for next year? Uh, keep uh, on the current year base. Situation as of now that we think in the world, like uh, yes, we should be clocking that. Unless until more challenges comes up. Uh, I think both the wars that is happening in Ukraine and uh, Israel, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of effort is being done to uh, you know contain those wars and uh, put back the economy of the world economy on 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 track. So as with what we are seeing as of now, we don't see any challenge uh, to get to our target. And uh, one bookkeeping question for Sanjay, what uh, what kind of tax rate uh, should we, uh, you know, model in our, uh, uh, sh should we model? Uh, because it's been up and down. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, so tax rate uh, uh, should be taken in anywhere between 16 to 18% uh, on a steady state basis. And this year, the India contribution to the profit pool is less. So, larger part of the profit is uh, in overseas entity, which has a lower tax rate. And uh, therefore, you know, you're seeing this uh, fluctuation coming up. But on a steady state basis, we believe that, you know, between 16 to 18 percent should be our effective tax rate. Fair enough. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Deha from Nivesha Investment Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, congratulations on the good set of numbers. I wanted to ask that, uh, you know, the in uh, one of the previous calls, you mentioned that uh, the U.S. market has started procuring from the near uh, near areas only, and that is the reason why we set up a central America plant. So, uh, is this change uh, uh, a long-term thing, or uh, would, we, would we see U.S. Uh, procuring material from other markets as well, so like uh, India, Vietnam, etc.? See, uh, the uh, 
these, the sourcing ability that is there in the Central American market is only a small fraction of compared to when you compare to the USA. Uh, sorry, the Asia, Asia sourcing. That means like you know Asian countries like you know uh, Vietnam, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. <clears throat> so all these countries, the kind of large capacities that we have, the numbers. So I can give you an example. Like you know even India, like uh, our export is about 18 billion dollars, 16 billion dollars. Between 16 and 18, we are moving. I think hopefully we will touch 18 very soon. So that uh, compared to that, Guatemala ships only two billion dollars as a country. So. Naturally, it's it's a very small fraction of of what Bangladesh and Vietnam and India and Indonesia can can do. So there are some investments that is going on there. The costs are high. There, the minimum wage and everything like you know you, you have to plan for at least about four hundred to five hundred dollars. Uh, uh, that kind of wage is there. So even like uh, some of the players like us and some of our uh, other uh, colleagues have definitely opened up uh, some kind of production unit there. Also, the limitation would be in terms of raw material. They don't have as many mills or as much of cotton or other growth that is happening in this part of Asia is not there. So yes, for the U.S. retailers, they want to mitigate risk. They might move about whatever, 3, 4, 5% five, 5 kind of sourcing into Central America. May, some people might go a little higher percentage, maybe going up to 10 to 12%. But they cannot shift uh, a very large chunk of, of their uh, manufacturing into that market. So Asia will continue to be important. Uh, and as we are seeing geopolitically as China and Myanmar is uh, going, uh, like, you know, is reducing in terms of apparel manufacturing and trading uh, internationally. So that's a very huge chunk of business that will be flowing into the other countries of Asia. So, so for now, it's not a big concern. But yes, uh, we went strategically to the Central Market, because Central America market, because uh, our key customers, where we are very closely working with, so they wanted that we have a presence there, and uh, they were guaranteeing certain amount of business. It will not be a large; it will be much smaller fraction of our total business. But yes, uh, it, it definitely helps in terms of our uh, presence in that area and uh, customer servicing that we want to do. And it's uh, not that it's not profitable, so it's definitely uh, something smart to do. Correct, sir. But so, like right now, uh, the Guatemala plant is sourcing just to the North America, right? Yes, Guatemala plant would be supplying to only North America market. Uh, and this, uh, I also want to understand this, that uh, geographical uh, data are uh, very precision in nature. So, why is that? Maybe we'll close to the mic. Hear you more clearly. Uh, hello, am I audible now? Yeah, better. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the geographical habitat which we have uh, is very fluctuating in nature. So uh, can you please explain uh, why is that so? Sanjay, will take the geographical habitat. Hello. Uh, sorry, I just repeat the question. I mean, uh, if I got it correctly, the saying why, the why is the fluctuation in geographical habitat. Collection in Abita for the group level. Uh, so group level, I think we are consistently improving Abita. Uh, there is a fluctuation in Abita in the standalone entity for the reason the top line is really uh, gone down in this quarter, which has impacted adversely because our fixed fixed cost remaining the same that could not be leveraged with the lower turnover, uh, which we hope that in coming quarter it will get addressed. Otherwise, if you look at our Abita trajectory, I think it has been. Uh, <laughs> in upward direction, plus minus uh, 0 0.5 bits only, and we believe that uh, we should continue to improve the beta as we go into the next financial year as well. Correct, sir. Uh, sir, I also wanted to understand this thing that if we get a uh, get an order from a particular geography, so uh, uh, so just for example, let's say we got an order from North America uh, and. Uh, is, is, is it uh, any uh, correlation between the plants which will supply from like the Bangladesh plant or the Indian plant or it can go from any uh, any of the plants? So normally for every location, we have certain products uh, which we develop from each of these locations, which are uh, like as Pearl, we do about six different categories of product. So that means like pants, t-shirts, woven tops, outerwear, uh, swimwear, 
reapware. So every plant is like you know have got some kind of specialization which we utilize. For this particular quarter, Q3, Q3, which may you may be like you know giving rise to this question that you are asking, is where we have seen quality product which was originally made in India and we took decision because of the pressure that we could get still better margin out of Bangladesh. Which was a quite a extraordinary uh, situation, I would say, that was happening because of the less or over inventory situation in USA, which resulted in much lesser order, and the market was super competitive and the margins were hit all across. So in that period, we took some smart decision, which we, so that we can maximize our return to all of you. So that's that's something like it was an exceptional uh, situation that Pearl, as a company, is ready to uh, execute like that. But in general, like our strategy and our infrastructure exists in a way so that each category is being serviced from from a location which has got its speciality correct sir uh, thank you a lot so, uh, it was really helpful. Uh, i hope it explains or should i explain more then you just let me know no uh, no uh, so uh, i'm clear with my doubt sir thank you thank you thank you <clears throat> thank you a reminder to all the participants you may press start and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Rohit Mehra from SK Securities. Please go ahead. Hello. Am I yes. audible? Yes, Mr. Rohit. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so the, my, my first question is, uh, what are we doing to improve our Indian operations and performance? So, uh, India, I think we are in strong uh, wicket. Like we are seeing uh, definitely a lot of uh, demand. Uh, like you see, like India, uh, we had specialized. For example, Pearl specializes uh, in the, the items like uh, women's blouses, shirts, uh, sleepwear, and those kind of products which are lighter weight uh, fabrics. So we are seeing uh, good uh, demand and good order book situation on that. So there was a situation, as I mentioned, in in the uh, last quarter which was the fag end of, of our uh, over inventory situation of US. And we could see and we could foresee that situation that was coming up. So we had worked with our uh, customers to ensure that we can give them a better price or hold on to their better wallet share and also give, generate better return for our uh, investors. So that's something was a decision that we are taking. But in general, India is in a strong wicket and we are experiencing growth uh, in the coming year. Uh, as we are seeing uh, the demand and, and the responses from our customers. We would be uh, exploring more options in India like to expand into other states as a lot of initiatives are coming from uh, from the government of India. So that growth plan and that strategy is we will continue to update you about how we plan it up for the next few years. So we, okay. I think we're on track uh, from India. Okay, understood, understood. And uh, can you share the expected top line and bottom line uh, based on the targets that is of F for FY25? And uh, what is our CapEx plan for uh, same, that is FY25? So, uh, I just want to say that, you know, we have already stated that we are looking at a 15 to 20 percent top line growth. Um, in for the next three years and that uh, guidance still remains there we um, with the kind of uh, capacity what we have we uh, and the customer relationship which is getting developed and the demand scenario which is like which is changing we are confident of uh, achieving 15 to 20 percent top line growth in the next uh, three to four year time uh, as far as the capex is concerned this year we have done uh, 120 crore of capex um, out of uh, we have we are committed a capex of 120 crore out of which 90 crore has been incurred which is a mix of uh, uh, automation which is a mix of capacity enhancement and certain replacement um, i have given the percentage last uh, in my last running call i can mention that out of uh, 90 uh, 50 crore has gone in capacity enhancement and uh, uh, 30 has gone in uh, in automation and uh, um, modern laundry equipment which we wanted to have in Bangladesh and 10 crore is towards uh, replacement of machinery. Uh, going forward in next financial year, I think every geography will have their capex requirement. We are uh, 
um, compiling the capacity requirement, I think uh, we should be in the range of uh, similar range of 80 to 100 crores <laughs> capex across geography. Um, but at the same time, every capex is looked at its merit of return on capital employed. But looking at the opportunity which lies ahead, I think we should be having this kind of uh, capex as a first step number to start with. Yeah, got it. Thank you for your detailed answer. Uh, so that's answer my question and all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Anurag Agarwal from Agarwal Analytical Investments. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. It was uh, very heartening to listen that uh, we have hired uh, KPMG as an auditor in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, could you throw some light if, uh, what, uh, like, uh, are we going to hire big four audit auditors for uh, Vietnam and other locations as well? Okay, I just uh, would like to update, I think, in the previous uh, call we did that. So, in Vietnam, we have a Deloitte as statutory auditor. Um, in Hong Kong, we have Ernst & Young as a statutory auditor. And in Indonesia, there is a Tier 2 firm, which is the top one in Tier 2, that's an auditor. And Bangladesh, we have now KPMG. So overseas location, we already have the uh, big four working as uh, statutory auditor. The reason is our profit uh, and the revenue um, and the capacity is also overseas maximum at this point in time. So the need of centering the uh, governance framework was felt in those overseas location, and that's how we have been making a change and a um, change of the auditor once their terms are. Uh, getting over to strengthen our government. Got it. Uh, another question, sir, you men mentioned that uh, in Bangladesh, uh, the wage hike will have an impact of about 1-1.5% one, one uh, on our EBITDA, but we are planning to negate them through automation or through getting more premium clients. So, are we close to adding any new uh, you know, client out there? So, I just want to clarify before Pallab can go ahead. It is 1 to 1.5 percent of uh, uh, top line of Bangladesh country. You know, it's not a group right. turnover, only Bangladesh country. Yeah, Pala, please go ahead. Yeah. So, yes, like we are going through all the three strategies. That means, like, you know, better efficiency and, uh, you know, dedicated production lines. Uh, second would be to increase the top line to have more volume so that our uh, overheads can be distributed over more. And the third would be to have uh, customers like who are with better margins or a better service level that we provide and get better margins as well. So all these strategies in place. Yes, we are in close communication with certain new customers, which we are starting soon. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the last part. Could you repeat the last part? Yes, I said like you know your question specifically was that uh, addition of new customers happening or not. So, yes, we are close to that, definitely. Okay. That's great to hear. And the last yes, question is... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. May I request that you return to the question queue? It's a very small question. Last one, if okay. you may allow. Uh, like, uh, there's going to be a Bharat Tech Expo in... Uh, Tech Expo in uh, Feb only. So, is your company going to participate in that? Yes. Sure. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pulkit Singhal from Dalmus Capital Management. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. At the outset, we would like to congratulate the management for significantly turning around the operations in the last two years despite challenging times. And also, particularly for centering the corporate governance initiatives when it comes to uh, independent directors as well as having big four auditors in the subsidy. We hope you will also consider the big four auditors for the standalone entity and India entity as well in the future. Um, secondly, uh, just, you know, uh, given, I mean, you sound more optimistic now in terms of uh, the potential demand going ahead. Um, how do we understand what would be the peak, say, revenue potential from your current capacity, uh, assuming the current level of raw material prices and some reasonable mix, whatever you think is right? Um, what would be that uh, figure? Sorry, 
So, as, as we mentioned that uh, our goal or what we are working for definitely in that 15 to 20 percent uh, range uh, of growth and uh, compared to uh, what happened two years back where there were a lot of inflation in the raw material prices which was also increasing or inflating the top line. So, compared to that, like even in our current price range, we are talking about this kind of growth that uh, we have targeted for ourselves. So that uh, we continue and we are confident of uh, achieving that. What I meant, Pallab, was uh, when does the capacities get over? So 15, if you achieve 15, 20% growth uh, uh, for the next year, uh, does that mean you're operating at 90% utilization at that point? Or, or do you still have room? To yeah, and see, uh, yes, definitely we have room to grow. Uh, if you had seen, like, originally uh, the kind of infrastructure that we have across all the region, we have, uh, with minimum capital expenditure, we can grow to almost up to about uh, another about 10 million pieces plus. Uh, we, we are currently, I think, in the range of about 60 million pieces, and with some investment, like, for example, certain growth that we are having in our factories where, where we are increasing a number of machines, a number of lines, with that kind of uh, minimal uh, capital expenditure, we can grow up to about 80, 84 million uh, pieces annually. So that's that's the current infrastructure that we have. But that doesn't mean that we are not looking for more opportunities, opportunities, opportunities and options. So that we continue to have. Uh, we may start a couple of additional factories over this uh, year or so, uh, both in in the countries where we are present very strongly. So that that will continue to happen as as we see. Like, uh, uh, in fact, if we go more than that, this current 15 percent, I think should be uh, workable. But even if we see that okay, there is a more potential and bringing in additional customers, they will really come up strong with us. So we can quickly go and have additional factories also with us. Today we have that uh, plan and options ready for us. Right. I mean, currently you're closer to 50 million pieces. I think in terms of shipped capacity, so that uh, 50 can kind of total 84 with smaller capacity. Yeah, so, yeah, last year we saw that we were around 54. Compared to that, I think uh, we should be, because the raw material prices have really gone down compared to the year before. So even, uh, you know, the kind of uh, growth that we are, uh, will be achieving this particular year, you will see that number of pieces have definitely gone. And I think that will continue to go up uh, again in the coming year. Uh, so, yes, currently what we are sort of talking about is uh, on the current raw material prices, which we don't see uh, immediately to go either way, down or up. So, with that uh, thing, uh, assuming that contains, uh, that remains constant, we are still on path uh, to the regular growth that we are uh, promising you. Okay. And are you looking at any M&A uh, in the future? Is that something you're working on? So, we took uh, that, uh, you know, uh, to raise capital, uh, so we took that uh, option uh, approval from our board. So we are ready for that. So if if some good opportunity comes up, why not? But as of now, I would say uh, like you know more of uh, the kind of uh, infrastructure that we have. We are planning more on that basis. But yes, we are always on the lookout for good options. Understood. And in terms of the margin profile, which is the potential margin profile, let's say as you scale up two years, three years, four years out, I understand. There's an element of product mix as well. Uh, we are already at closer to 9% kind of margin, and, and you had guided to double digit. But I'm just trying to understand, is this business, and given Pearl Global model, uh, which is different from other governing companies in India, I mean, is this uh, is the band more like a 13 to 15 kind of percentage margin business that is possible, or is it more on the lower end in terms of double digits that is there? Would you like to answer that, or uh, maybe just uh, uh, take this uh, question? Yeah, okay. So, in terms of the margin uh, trajectory, you know, I think one is that you know, with the your question was whether three years down the line, when we achieve uh, those kind of a growth in top line as to where the margin can go. So, let's say that we are achieving that 15 to 20 percent growth. I think we should be looking at uh, uh, definitely three to four percent improvement from where we are right now. Uh, given the leverage, it will play out over a period of time. The um, the 
uh, given that you know the infrastructure which is already built in terms of design, marketing, and the group structure we have to facilitate that growth. Now going to 13, 14, 15 percent, I think it's. Uh, um, I mean, some of our factory universities are already generating that kind of a margin. So as you mentioned in your question itself, you know, it's a question of product mix which uh, which prevails. I think it is always a combination of which product prevails and how do you really capture the wallet share. So once you try to balance it out, uh, maybe there is some uh, averaging happens. But yes, there are certain styles which already generate 13 to 15 percent, and a few factory, couple of factories are already just working on that parameters. So uh, I hope I am able to uh, give you. So there is no clear direction in the sense that 13 to 15 percent, but yes, there is an opportunity exists in certain pockets. In the given segment, where you can achieve that number, and on a blended one, you know, uh, uh, 12, 13 percent can be achievable if you know three years down the line when we are looking at, so the, or when we keep on achieving 15 to 20 percent growth year on year basis. Understood. Very clear. Um, thank you, and all the thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Pulavarti Saikiran, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. Am I audible? Yes, Mr. Pulavarti, please go ahead. Yeah. So just one quick question. Uh, your business seems to have a very high fixed asset turnovers, probably in the range of six currently, but even if I look at in the last 10 years, they hovered between four to six times. Uh, looks like reasonably higher when compared with other peers, more so in the textile industry. What explains this, and how do you see this going forward so that we can just get a handle on what kind of capex we might be needing? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Uh, so, asset turn in our uh, you know business normally is four, four to four point five when the factories are operating at their peak level. It means the operation has stabilized post the start of the new operation. And as the, as the operation keeps on going specified seven years <laughs> down the line, uh, the asset turns start increasing naturally because the depreciation asset will keep on generating. The life of the asset is, you know, already 10 years, 12 years plus, so which means that your asset turn goes on a higher side as the asset keep on aging in that sense. And there is a very uh, nominal repair and maintenance expenses one incurs towards that. Um, now, the second asset turn <coughs> component is, you know, the combination of own capex plus the partnership factory. Uh, to give an example that, you know, if we have four our own factory in Bangladesh, one in Vietnam, we have a similar amount, similar number of factory which are working on a partnership model, which means that, you know, with the same amount of infrastructure, you are able to actually finance your turnover. So that's why, you know, the asset turn will always be, with our focus on asset light business model, the asset turn will be <coughs> sustainable in uh, between five to six uh, level in in in, time, in years to come also, and in India also our strategy is to work in a model where uh, the investment in not very heavy in in the big asset uh, where we are able to generate easily four to five kind of asset turns. So on a steady state basis, I think when the operations start in the initial period when the new operation stabilizes, uh, anywhere between four to five should be the norm. We expect our milk factory to generate. Thanks for this. So just one thing, if you can just elaborate further, you said regarding the partnership model, uh, is my understanding right that they will put in uh, or they will share the capex and hence asset terms will be higher? That's what you were suggesting? Yeah, so uh, currently the structure is that there are many uh, factories which are already operating, but they lack marketing design capabilities, so that's where the Pearl joins hand with them use their infrastructure and get a marketing order to them to provide the quality inspection and everything. And uh, we also provide a working capital uh, arrangement in terms of sourcing of fabric to control the quality of uh, raw material which goes into garment. And that helps us in terms of improving an overall asset uh, utilization. Do you find this more scalable, sir? So you would, uh, uh, you, if, if you have to think for the next few years, you will be in a position to identify more opportunities like this, hence you will be able to scale this up further across the geographies, or is it a, this model is more specific to any specific geography as such? Yeah, so wherever the uh, market, the production manufacturing market is more matured, this particular uh, model exists uh, more uh, cohesively out there. 
In India, uh, it's still less. But if I look at uh, Bangladesh and Vietnam, where uh, who does a substantial uh, contribution to the world uh, trade or world manufacturing of a, so there this uh, this model is much more uh, prevalent. So uh, as well, you know, you will see that almost about uh, you know about 10, 15, 20 percent of our business would always be in this uh, in this model, where capital expenditure may not be ours fully. Thanks, Lo, sir. Thanks, Lo. This is really helpful. Thank you. Highly appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. As there are no further questions from the participants, I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Thank you, everyone. I hope we have been able to answer all your questions satisfactorily. However, should you need any further clarification or would like to know more about the company, please feel free to contact our team or SGA, our investor relations advisor. Thank you once again for taking the time to join us on the call. On behalf of World Global Industries Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.